spirit deep into our hearts so that it may bear fruit. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. All right, so I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in the world. And uh, we can see that all kinds of things are happening, but I want to focus specifically on Israel. How many know, can see what's happening in Israel, right? I think as Christians, we must not ignore what is happening over there because the Bible tells us that the, the Jerusalem in this case, or Israel, is almost like a, like a time, time clock. Everything evolves in some ways around that. And we have to pay attention to what happens in Israel or Jerusalem because that indicates the season or the time that we find ourselves in. So if you understand what the Bible says, then you will also understand what is actually happening and what the Lord is actually saying to his church during this time and this season. So I want to read to you a little bit of into the book of Zechariah. And as you can see, what do we see in Israel? Of course, we see Israel being attacked by neighboring countries. In this case, the latest that happened was that Iran, you know what, sent a few missiles. I think it was like over 200 missiles that went over to Israel. Now we are expecting or people are expecting Israel to defend themselves or retaliate one way back. And Iran already said that if Israel does that, they're going to attack again. So what does that mean? That means that very likely, you know what, this will escalate. And not only will escalate, now we see other countries now getting ready to get involved into it. That very well, this could lead to a big war in the whole region, right? And if we're not careful or if the people involved are not making the right choices, eventually this become, can turn into a third world war as well. Because this is what the Bible actually tells us. And I want to read something to you because this is exactly what was prophesied in the book of Zechariah. And I want you to read this. I want you to read this with me and, and, and listen to it because our hearts must be ready to see what is about to unfold. And not only must be ready for that, but it must also be ready to act in this season accordingly to what is happening in the world. In other words, we can't just simply ignore that. We can't just simply say, oh, that's happening over there. I'll just keep going on with my life like nothing is happening. No, God is waking up. He's shaking up his people. He's drawing us to, to pay attention so that we can prepare knowing that his coming is coming soon, right? That he's coming is soon. I'm not saying Jesus is going to come back this year. I'm not saying he's returning for his church, you know, like in the next few months. I'm not saying that. But we know that the season is here. We know that he's saying get ready because you're seeing and unfold before your eyes the things that were prophesied, you know, thousands of years ago. Amen. Let's pray. Sorry, let's read. This is like this. Zechariah 14, verse 1. Zechariah 14, verse 1 is like this. A day of the Lord is coming, you know, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. It says, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured and the houses ransacked and the women raped. Now, I want you to think about this. This is very harsh. That means that they're going to attack Israel. The nations will come. Every nation will come. Eventually, one day, even the U.S., because the Bible says all nations will come against Israel. Now, this is very interesting because we have to understand that all throughout the Bible, we see somehow the devil always trying to destroy who? Israel. Always. Trying to oppress it, trying to enslave it, trying to, you know, one way or another attack it from all angles. And the battles that we see in the Old Testament, we see how David and the kings were always fighting their enemies around them. Because in some ways, they were not obedient to the word of God. They were not doing exactly as God led them to do. And because of these reasons, many of their enemies were left to multiply and to grow and eventually conspire against them and attack them over and over. And of course, today we see the same thing. But we have to look at the spiritual side behind it, which is really the devil trying to destroy what? God's people. We are the spiritual Israel, if you knew that. We have been drafted into Israel. We have been drafted into God's kingdom. And now we, in this case, have an opportunity to embrace that and to pray, knowing that God tells us that if we pray for Israel, in other words, we bless Israel, we will also be blessed. He tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. He tells us to, you know, constantly keep them in our prayers because one day their eyes will be open and they will believe, right? But we have to understand that he also tells us that when he's about to come, all these things will begin to unfold. So I want to keep reading again. So it says like this. 
Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half the mountain moving south. So what is he saying here? Yes, half of the people will have to run away from the city. They will have to go into exile. Half will stay. But the Lord himself, now talking about Jesus himself, when he comes down, the first he's going to do is, the thing he's going to do, what? He's going to touch on this area, on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. He's going to touch it. And as he lands, it says that this rock or this mount will actually break in half. This is how powerful his coming will be. Not only will do that, he says, but he's coming to do what? To destroy all those that came against Israel. Now, I want you to think about that. Because today we see a lot of things and a lot of arguments and a lot of reasons for people to take sides on the other side, right? They, they say, oh, Israel is this, Israel is that. And you know what? In some ways, maybe it is true in some cases. But is it really as a nation? Is it just a, a part of the government? Is it maybe just a group of people that are more involved in the army that are doing these kind of things? We don't really know. We're not there to actually be able to discern by ourselves and to, you know, to understand what is happening. But we have to go with what we hear. Now, is what we hear really true? Is it all the truth? Or is it a biased opinion or something to persuade us to think or to believe or to begin to take sides and to cause more division between people, right? But we're seeing that a lot of people, even younger people, taking sides against Israel because, one, maybe they don't understand what is actually happening. But the Lord is saying, you know what, he will come and do what? Defend Israel. He will begin to destroy those that raised or came against Israel. So it's on our best interest as God's people to be on God's side. I don't know about you, but that makes sense, doesn't it? Even if we don't understand what is actually happening. Let's keep going. It says, on that day, so this is for number four. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split into two from east and west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half of the mountain moving south. He says, you will flee, says, by the mountain valley, for it will be extended to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. What is he saying? Who's coming with Jesus? The holy ones. Which holy ones? Who? Who's coming with Jesus? <laughs> are you doubting or are you convinced? I'm convinced that I'm coming down with Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm coming down with Jesus. That's what he's saying. We're going to come down and do what? He's coming to establish his kingdom, right? And to show the world that he is king. Not only king, but king of kings and lord of lords. That he is almighty, that he can do anything. In fact, the moment he steps, a valley opens up. A whole, you know, uh, you know separation of these mountains begins to happen. And people are going to notice. Not only are they are going to notice when he steps, but they're going to notice when he comes on the clouds with all what? Who? With the saints, with all the holy ones. So what does that mean? That means that we're coming down. We're coming down and we're going to be on the winning team. We're going to see real changes. And people don't understand that we're right now living at the end of an era. An era is about to finish. An era is ending right now. That's why we have these birth pains. Like the Bible tells us that it will be like that. The birth pains will begin. And I believe the, birth, the first birth pain that came was actually with COVID. <laughs> that was the first one saying a baby's coming and there's nothing you can do to stop this. It is imminent. It is inevitable. That baby is going to be born. And when that baby is born, what happens? Jesus comes and a new era begins. The era where he begins to reign on this earth. With who? His saints, the holy ones. With us. 
Or do you want to be, I don't know about you, do you want to be left up in heaven by yourself up there and everybody's down here with Jesus? <laughs> I want you to think about this, really. Think about it because this is exciting for us. This is exciting for each and every one of us because that means our, ba our faith must be boosted to the point that we are convinced that we are going to be on the winning team. That no matter what happens, even if we were to lose our lives in the process, we're still coming down with him. Do you believe it? You have to believe it. You have to be excited about it because it will be unprecedented. It will be like nothing ever seen before in the history of the world. It will be something that will be glorious. Something that no one will be able to deny. And all the nations will begin to do what? To notice and to submit to his leadership. Isn't that amazing? Believe me, the devil will not find a place to hide. <laughs> Anyway, let's keep going with this. Number six. On that day, there will be neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. It says, it will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord, with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. So think about this. The Bible tells us that the day of the Lord, the day that will be not only a horrible, dreadful day, for us it will be glorious. But for the people that don't know Jesus, that don't know even expect Jesus to come, for them it will be. It will be dreadful. It will be something horrific, something that they will be crying, and even some may be even fainting to see all these things unfold before their own eyes. But for us, it's going to be glorious because we will be here to see this event. Yes, the Bible says that eventually what happens the sun will no longer shine. That's what this verse is saying as well. That he will come when it's evening, when it's dark, but yet there will be light. Why do you think there will be light? Because he's going to shine. He's going to shine and we're going to shine with him. Amen? Because he is the light of the world. And that light is in us. And we are also light of, that, of this world because he shines through each and every one of us. Number eight says, on that day, it says, living water will flow out from Jerusalem. Half of the, it says, half, it says, of it east of the Dead Sea and half of, of it west of the Mediterranean Sea in summer and in winter. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. The whole land from Gaba to Raymond, south of Jerusalem, will become like the Arabah. But Jerusalem will be raised up, says, high from the Benjamin gate to the side of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of the Hananel to the, to the royal uh, wine press and will remain in its place. It will be inhabited never again. Will it be destroyed? Jerusalem will be secure. So he's coming. And he's coming with power. He's coming to defend Israel. He's coming to take over the world. And all kings, all kings will submit to him. I want you to think about that. That's why he's the king of kings. He's going to become the king of all the kings that are on this earth. On this earth. And eventually we will see every knee bow down. And every time we'll confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now why is this important to know? Because we're seeing the beginnings of all this. We're beginning to see that Jerusalem is now being attacked, being surrounded, and this battle has been going on for years. From the moment Jerusalem gets, or Israel became a nation recognized by the UN, a whole new era started. Prophecies were being fulfilled. And that began to tick a clock that now indicates that we're really in these end times. Remember, if one day for God is a thousand days for us, right? That means that, you know what, not much time has passed since, since Israel became a nation. That means that we're truly living in these times, and now the birth pains are here. That's what we're seeing right now. We know they're going to get more intense, more frequent. We're going to see more things happen. But for us, we have hope. For us, we know what's going to happen, even if we were to die and lose our lives in the process. The Bible says that those that die during the tribulations, they will be the first ones to resurrect 
when Christ comes. And they will be transformed in the twinkle of an eye. But if we are still alive during that process, that means that if you're still able to go through the tribulations and still be alive for some reason that is divine by God, for some reason that you, you know what, you were able to do what God led you to do and you didn't die, but you stayed strong and you were, you know, letting people know about his love and all his love, that means that that moment you will be transformed and we will go what? We will meet up in heaven with him and then what will happen? Is he going to take us back to heaven and then come back? No. He says he's coming where? Down with who? With who? With who? With who? <laughs> Do you really believe that? Or you're still doubting? Do you really believe it? I believe it. That's why I'm excited when I share this because it doesn't matter how painful this process may be of giving birth to this baby. But what's coming is glorious. And we're going to see his saints come down in new bodies that will not decay, that will not get sick, that will not experience pain. And we will reign, what, on this earth for what, how long? For a thousand years with him. That means that we will live for a thousand years with him on this earth because we'll have new bodies that will not die. Now, I don't know about you, but that changes everything. That changes everything. That changes everything. And he's going to show us what real peace really looks like. Right? But that's what's happened today. But unfortunately, before we get to that point, like it says, no one knows the day that he's coming. Not even Jesus himself. The Bible says not even Jesus knows the day that the Father will say to him, Hey, son, it is time. We know the seasons, we know the times, but we don't know the day or the hour. That's what the Bible says. And when that day comes, that's when everything is going to change. Now, why is this important to know? Because this gives us hope. This helps us understand that our faith is crucial in this time. It's essentially something that is non-negotiable. You cannot be doubting that Jesus Christ is Lord. You cannot be doubting that Jesus Christ is going to forsake you and abandon you. You cannot be focusing on the pain that this world is about to experience. You have to focus on what he's promised us so that even if we were to lose our lives, we will gain eternal life. Because this is all temporary. Right? I was having this conversation with someone the other day. I said, imagine this. We're so worried about not dying, right? But to God, is like he's not interested whether we live that long or not. Because in the end, we're going to be either saved, right? And we're going to be with him forever and ever. Yes, the people that stay behind are the ones that suffer. But the people that pass on, they're rejoicing. They're laughing. They're smiling. They're, they're praising the Lord and, and thanking him for that VIP pass they got. Yes, I'm not saying it's easy to let go of someone. Believe me, I experienced it myself recently too, right? But what I'm saying is that we're so worried about this that we forget what is coming. We forget that once we experience salvation and we experience this new life in Christ and we experience, you know, what, what he wants us in a life, all of a sudden your perspective and your mind change. Thank you so much. So I'm super excited. I'm super excited. Because the clock is ticking. And it's almost midnight. You understand what that means? When that clock strikes midnight, there's no going back. And the time is almost there. How many of you ever heard that story of the Cinderella? Right? Midnight came. And the truth came. The real truth. She had to accept the truth that she was not a princess, right? But we have to accept the truth. The truth is that Jesus is coming no matter what. And that all the devils and all the evil that we see out in the world is going to run. It's going to try to hide. That's why we see all these elite and all these people trying to create bunkers in the mountains and trying to prepare for this time because they think that somehow they're going to run away from the king of kings. Impossible. He knows everything. He's almighty. All he has to do is say it, and it happens. Right? Now, having said this, I want you to think about this, because in this time, what we're seeing is that people are forgetting this. 
People are not paying attention. And they're worried about their needs. They're worried about the things that they couldn't get, the things that they want, and the things that they lost, and the things that this. And they were forgetting the bigger picture that this is leading us to that glorious point in history that we will see Jesus Christ come with who? You don't believe it, do you? <laughs> with us. <laughs> with the saints. With the holy ones. I want you to understand this because the misconception, and I say this, has been that, you know what, Jesus is coming to take us out, right, out of this world, and then somehow we're going to be in heaven while all this goes haywire, right? It goes into a big mess. But that's not what we read here, is it? What we're reading is that he's coming down with us. We're coming down with him. <laughs> I am, yeah. Because it doesn't matter how much we may suffer in the next few years, it's going to pay it off. It's going to be worth it. Because we're going to come down with him. All right, so I want to read this other scripture to you. And this is what we're living right now, and I, and I say it as a warning to all of us. Because if we don't, we're going to make the same mistakes that we're going to read this story. And you probably know this story, but I want to read it. I want to... I can emphasize it again. This is, again, uh, the book of Matthew 22. And it's the story of the banquet where the king that offered a banquet for waiting for his son and invited all his guests to come down. Okay? And we're going to see what unfolds. Number 22 says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Now, who is the king? Jesus, right? Oh, in this case, no, no, it's the father. God the father has a son. He's saying, hey, I want to invite all these people to this banquet because my son is getting married. Who is he getting married to? Who? The church, the bride, right? He's getting married to the bride. He's saying, look, I'm preparing a big feast. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss this feast. I don't want to miss this wedding, the wedding of the millennium, <laughs> of all history. We cannot miss this out. <laughs> and it says like this. It says, he sent his services to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. Says, my oxen are fattened, cattle have been you know, butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Now, who are the servants? They're us. The prophets. The people that were here before us. He sent the first servants to invite. They didn't want to come, so he sent some more to do the same task. Tell everyone, in this case, tell my people, tell those that I love or those that are my friends. Understandable uses for not going to following Jesus. Jesus, I'm too busy. I just bought a home. I don't have time for you, Jesus. I just got a promotion in my corporate, you know, uh, job. You know, I'm, I'm so busy, I got to work 12 hours a day and, you know, five, six days a week. And, and I just have not time for you, Jesus. And Jesus said, come, come to my wedding. Come to this wedding, the party of the millennium. And people are saying, I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm sorry, God. I don't have time. 
I like to be there, but I have more important things to do than to be with you in celebrating this time. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have anything more important than Jesus. I don't have any more important than to learn about him. Yes, we all got to work, we all got to do this, but that is secondary. Because who is the one that gives us the jobs? Who is the one that gives the provision to us? Who is the one that heals us? Who is the one that gives us you know, the ability to breathe this morning and get up and be here today? Right? So what happens? The king was enraged. Not only did they come up with the excuses, but eventually they ended, up, they ended up killing the servants that he sent to them to invite them. People that have paid with their blood, with their lives for testifying and, and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Invite them to have their beautiful banquet where we'll see Jesus marry his bride. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes? Let's keep going. The wedding, those are invited, because they gave importance to his invitation. They prioritized others, and they did not listen to what he wanted them, or why he wanted them to come. Number nine says, so go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Notice it says, go find anyone, the good and the bad. In other uh, gospels it says, the lame, the blind, the paralyzed, the people that were rejected by society. The people that did not seem to be worth anything at all. And he says, I don't care who you bring. Make sure my banquet is full. And that's why we're here. Because we're not, we're not good people in the sense that, you know what, no one is good. The Bible says no one is good, only the Father. And even if we think we're good, we're still, our justice or righteousness is like a filthy rag, the Bible says. So that means that we didn't deserve to be invited, but we got invited. We got invited. Israel, in some ways, was the first one to be invited. And they said, ah, we don't believe. We don't believe. So what did he do? He invited everyone else. And that's why we're here today. All of us that are not Jewish, now we're Gentiles. And we were Gentiles, but now we are believers. We are the holy ones that will come down with him. Am I making sense? Yes? Let's keep going. So it was just full. Number 11 says, But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? It says, The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, says, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. What does that mean? That means that he's not going to allow anyone to come in unless they do what? Unless they are transformed and they have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. It's not just believing in God. We have to show what? Works of righteousness. That means that we actually have to practice and live out the Bible. We have to show this world that we truly believe in Jesus. How? By being obedient to him. By submitting to him. By removing the sin of our lives. By changing our clothes. Because you know what? All these clothes, yes, we see them. But if you look in the spiritual realm, we all come with filthy rags. And then he comes and does what? He changes us. He gives us brand new garments, brand new tunics. He gives us a white as snow tunics. And all of a sudden, we're dressed how? Like royalty. Because we're the children of the Most High God, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Does that make sense? Now, the question will be this. You know, do we really believe all this stuff? Or is it just a fairy tale, you know, a story that sounds very nice and very interesting? 
No. He is coming and no one will be able to sneak in. That means that no one is getting saved. No one is going to be present at that wedding when, you know what, every soul that ever existed will be present in that uh, wedding. All the saints, all the saints, all the saints that throughout all this history accepted the Lord, that believed in the Lord, that lived according, they will be present. Those that will be saved for eternity. But then we will have those that will also burn in hell, in the lake of fire for an eternity. Now the choice is yours. Do you want to turn down the invitation and pay with, a, with your soul? Or would you like to come to that wedding, have a blast, and on top of that, enjoy the rest of eternity with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? This is very important right now. No one knows when Jesus truly is coming, but we understand the seasons. We look at the signs, and the signs are saying, get ready, church, get ready, church, get ready, church. He is warning us, get ready, prepare yourselves. You know, prepare yourselves in every way, not only spiritually, but also physically, because we know things will get tough. And you heard my message a couple of weeks ago on what the Lord was showing me and what we need to do as a church and all these things. And that's why I believe that we need to step out in faith. In other words, we need to go where? To the highways and the byways. And to invite as many people as possible to this wedding. That means that we need to change our mindset as a church. Unfortunately, the I say, this church is beautiful. And it's so comfortable that we want everything to happen inside these four walls. And people don't want to come here. So what do we have to do? We, the servants, have to go out, out there and do what? Invite them to come to the banquet, to the party, to the wedding. But if we don't have this mindset, Jesus is also coming and says, Hey, what have you done? What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with the talents I gave you, with the giftings I gave you? Were you tending my, in this case, my, my vineyard? I left you to look after it, and then you guys are distracted. You're bored. You're not doing the work that I assigned you to do. So we disqualify ourselves. And he's coming. And he's not going to make exemption of anyone. It doesn't matter how good you were. It doesn't matter if you chopped up your arm to give it to somebody else. It doesn't matter if you, you know, ripped your heart out so that someone else could live. It doesn't matter. It's not about our sacrifice. It's about us being obedient and believing and following the ways of the Lord. Because only he knows the sin that we carry on the inside. Only he knows when we have jealous thoughts. Only he knows when we are filled with bitterness, with anger, with fear. Only he knows when we have lustful thoughts. Only he knows these things, and we know it ourselves too. But we have to let him do what? Cleanse us. Set us free from all this. But it starts by how? By confessing our sin, repenting of our sin, and understanding that we got to get right with God. This is the hour. This is the hour of redemption. This is the hour that we must get ready to go where? To that party. That's why I told you that we're going to change many things in the church. One of those things I told you with the men. Men are meeting twice a, a month. With this purpose to build up the men because many men will faint. Many men will fall apart. Many men will actually even hurt their own families by not being ready and grounded on the word of God. Because people will fall apart when all this begins to unfold. And men in particular, I said to you, they're the ones keeping society together. If the men fall apart, the whole thing falls apart. And that's why we're going to take out these meetings and begin to do them in, in the hotels so that we can create a movement of men being restored to what God wants them to be, to be able to lead their families, to be responsible, to be accountable, to have moral values. Not men that are filled with all kinds of lust and greed and things like that that end up, you know, breaking the human soul. So we're working this plan. The second thing God told us is get ready because also next year, He's going to lead us to do a massive event, a city event, where we actually 
maybe get a park or a, a venue when we invite all of Vaughn, all of this whole area from, I don't know, Bolton to Richmond Hill and, you know what, King City down to, you know, to North York. It doesn't matter where. The point is to throw out the invitation, to throw out the net so they can hear the gospel. But that takes money, right? But God's going to provide it. I know that. There are many of you here that without me telling you any of these things, you are having these dreams. Many of you here that were confirming that what God was speaking to me is actually what God wants us to do. The question is, do we believe it ourselves? Do we believe that it's possible? Do we understand it is enough or believe it enough that we can actually begin to pray into it so that God will bring the right elements, the right people, the right places, the right things so that we will see a massive what? Conversion, a massive revival that we will see people come to the Lord, run to the Lord, because I believe next year is not going to be a, a, a walk in the park. Next year is going to be very difficult for a lot of people. If right now is difficult, next year is going to intensify maybe 10 times more. Are we ready? Or are we too busy with ourselves? Are we seeing the signs? Or are we just simply not understanding why we're here in this time of, in history? No, this is the most exciting time in history. Because the people out there have no clue what is going to happen. But we have the Bible. We know what is going to happen. We know how whole, this whole thing is going to unfold. So when you know who's going to win, do you worry when the opposite team maybe scores a goal or two? No, you don't care because you know the outcome. You know that your team is going to win. You know that Jesus wins in the end. He's already won. He's just coming to claim it, to take possession of this, to establish his kingdom. But we need to go where people are. We need to reach them where they're at. We need to go to the highways and byways and invite them to come to the kingdom of heaven. Not to the church in general. I'm not talking you should fill this whole church with people. No, people will automatically gravitate to the churches when they see the kingdom of heaven being manifested. When they begin to have this encounter with Jesus. When everything else fails, when the government fails them, when their family fails them, when they get abandoned by their friends. All of these things, people say, who is there left to help me? They will cry out to Jesus. They will cry out to God. But do we believe it? Or are we still not sure if it's going to happen or not? Or uh, we just don't give it much importance because, ah, yeah, they've been saying that Jesus is coming for the last 2,000 years and he has yeah, but let me tell you, 2,000 years, we're not seeing the things that we're seeing today. 2,000 years, we're not seeing, again, that Israel is being attacked, in this case, in a possible where everyone will turn against them. Like it was prophesied, like what we just read. So the question I ask you today is, what are we doing with our time? Are you distracted? Are you wasting your time on things that fill you and have nothing good to bring into your life? Or are you filling yourself with Jesus, with his word, becoming stronger and stronger in your faith every day so that you can withstand any attack that may come, whether physical in the sense that people may come to try to take away what, you know, what we may have, but having enough faith to say, you know what, it's okay. I'm not attached to the things of this world. It's okay to let go of this. It's okay to let go of this. It's okay to lose a loved one too. You know why? Because I know that if I die, I'm going. With my Lord, going with my Christ. And I'm coming down with Him too. I'm coming down with Him. <laughs> or are you going to stay up there? Huh? I'm coming down. <laughs> I want to see. I want to experience. Because you know what? He's coming to reign, and we're going to reign with Him. That is an invitation of the King of Kings saying, I want you to be part of my kingdom. I want you to reign with me. I want to entrust you. I want to give you responsibility. I want to maybe put you over a city to reign over a city. That's what he's promising to us. I'm not saying we should do it for that reason. No, we're doing it because we love him. And if we're faithful and obedient till the end, even to the point of death, he will reward us.
So having said this, I want to share one more last thing. I know it's getting late. I know nine o'clock. As you know, we have this beautiful church. It's been a blessing. We've seen a lot of people come in through this church. Yes, we've had trials like every church has. We had moments that, yes, were challenging. You know, I know like I told you last year, the passing of my wife was not easy for the church. It was not easy for me or for many of you that maybe your faith felt like it deflated. Because we expected maybe one thing and God said, no, I want to do something else. But that was a test for us to see if regardless of the outcome, if we were still going to love Jesus, if we were going to be faithful with him. Now look at this. We know that sometimes the church gets full. I know many are sick today. That's why we're seeing a lot of empty chairs. But usually I believe the church gets about 80 or 90% full. I believe this church is no longer sufficient for us. Why do I say that? We have a lot of kids. And we have this beautiful foyer over here. Unfortunately, we have to use it for eating, for networking, mingling, and on top of that, the children is the only space they have to be themselves. So they run around and they are themselves. And they press many buttons and many of the adults that are here today. Right? It's true. Kids are kids. They have to do what they have to do. But we also understand from God. We want to be ministered to. We want to connect. And unfortunately, we don't have the space. We are ready downstairs we're only allowed to use one room downstairs and we have three groups of kids so what do we do how do we handle this the tweens are you know from 10 to 12 they actually sit in the hallway or they get some chairs and they have their class in the hallway because there's no more class we have the bigger room out there which is the, the five to nine use which is the bigger group and then we have the two to four kids that Unfortunately, we don't have another class for them, so they have to be out there in the foyer so that they can have their class or at least be themselves and get used to coming to church. But that can create chaos sometimes, right? I believe that we will see an influx of people coming soon. And I believe God is... a blessing for us. We've seen the growth in this church. And there are many that are watching online as well that, you know what? They had their, they had their um, transformation, encounter, deliverance, healing, you know, because of all the things that God did, you know, in this place through each and every one of us. And there's a church that we're looking at that is double the size of this church. This church can fit about 120 people. The other church we're looking at is about 250 people. Three areas. It has a designated area for the kids with three or four rooms specifically for kids. It has a, a room with uh, foosball tables and things for the youth. It has uh, an area for that we can eat and, uh, you know, a, a foyer and the whole thing. And just the, the lobby of the church is, is bigger than this church. It's twice as big as this church. It's a massive church. Unfortunately, they ask three times more than what we pay here. We pay $1,000 here, which is a great price. They won $3,000. Unfortunately, as a church, we cannot afford it right now because we will be super tight that we will not be able to because we got to pay for other things, you know. But I believe that as God begins to steer us, we can put ourselves to this goal or mindset or, or, or intentionality of saying, you know what? We believe that God will bring more people. But that's up to us in going out there, invite them to God's kingdom and do the things that we're doing with the men in the hotels, the worships in the hotels, and this event that we're planning again for next summer. So if we believe it's going to happen, that means that we need to make sure that we get a boat that is bigger that can handle all those fish. Right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be believing it. So I want you to begin to pray about this. I want you to begin to pray into this. and say, Lord, if it's your will, open the doors. Give us the finances. Whether it's that church or another church, it doesn't matter where it is. The point is that if we believe it's coming, 
we got to get ready. And that will help resolve many of the issues that sometimes we have here with all the running and the kids and this and that and all that, you know, that in some ways, you know what, it affects us all. We're, we're joyful to see all the kids running because that's the future of the church. I, I, will, I believe I was one of those kids at one point. But I also know that, you know, we need to improve many areas in what we're doing. We need more volunteers, more people involved. Today, unfortunately, we had many people sick and we had to cancel the classes for these guys and, and we don't, didn't have enough ushers today. And, you know, anyway, it is what it is. We do what we do and here we are. We don't come for the service. We come for God, right? Your job and, you know, and serving each other, helping each other, being there for each other. We will see, I believe, even more people Come and get them the help they need, the encouragement they need, the attention they need. But it's up to us whether or not we believe in it. Right? That's what the Bible tells us we need to do what? To invest our time, our energy, our talents, resources. Where? In the kingdom of heaven. That means that if you have an hour free, give it to the Lord. Even have an, have an extra piece of pie. You know what? Hey, brother, you, you're hungry? Here's a piece of pie. We help each other. We are a community. God is moving between all of us, right? But these are just thoughts. But I believe that you begin to pray into them and they begin to happen. They begin to change the way that we think, the way that we believe. And we see the things that are not as if they are. And we begin to be convinced that God is going to provide and give the things that we need so that we can rent the bigger space. Global faith was boosted last weekend. Let's begin to pray about it. Let's begin to pray about all the souls that will come in this event next summer that we will be doing. And I declare that in Jesus' name. That we will see... Thousands of people come to the Lord, run to Jesus Christ, because they're going to hear the stories. They're going to see evidence of the power of God transforming, bringing deliverance, bringing change, and all these things. My friend, if I may give your story today, I forget your name. The gentleman is sitting in the back over there with a sweater. Lift your hand, please. He heard a voice, and it said, look for a church named Go." Go, he goes, what kind of church is that? He Google it up, and what church did he find? I go. So he went, and he's here today. Who brought him? The Lord himself told him, go or go. Go, <laughs> go or go. Many stories we hear that Jesus is revealing himself in visions and dreams to Muslims around the world because they can't hear the message any other way. So he is revealing himself to them. So I believe the Lord is doing this all throughout the world. He is revealing himself because he is inviting what? Everyone, the good and the bad, to come to where? To that banquet where the King of Kings is going to be. And he's about to marry his church. Am I making sense tonight? So it's up to us to prepare and to get ready. It's up to us to be excited, to pray into all this. But let's not forget that we need to be those servants that go out and invite the to come to that wedding banquet. Let us pray. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for this beautiful night, Lord God. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful, Lord God, community that you've given to us. Because it's your body, Lord God. We know that we were inserted into your body. That we are part of you. And I thank you, Jesus, because it is, it is your wisdom, it is your head, it is you. You are the head of this church that give us what we need, the encouragement, the strength, you give us the power, Lord God, to, to make things happen, to, 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 to overcome, Lord God, problems, situations in our lives, Lord God, that no matter what happens, 
that we can be look at, in a place where we don't lose our joy, that we don't lose our peace, that we don't lose our identity in who we are in you, Jesus. But more than that, I pray, Lord God, that you may help us understand the urgency for us to share the gospel, the urgency for us to go out there, as you said, go and heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, you know, minister to the brokenhearted, help the poor, all these things you told us to do. So, Lord, help us. Help us believe. Help us believe that you can use us, that you want to use us, because the kingdom of heaven is within each and every one of us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the resources. I pray, Lord God, for this whole area, Lord God, that you begin to prepare the hearts so that next summer, Lord God, we will see masses, masses of people, thousands of people coming, running to you, Jesus. But Lord, I pray more than that that you may allow us to be unified, to be together in one accord, one vision, one spirit, so that we can work together, Lord God, to see this happen in our city. Lord, you are the owner of the gold and silver in this earth. And you will provide all these things. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord God. And I ask, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit, Lord God, we just continue to reaffirm, Lord God, to build our faith even more. That no matter what happens, Lord God, and no matter what is happening with our families, with our jobs, our finances, that we would always look up to the sky and say, thank you, Jesus, because I know I belong to you. That all of this is purifying my heart. All of this is helping me become stronger. All of this is bringing me closer to you. All of this is preparing me for that wedding. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, we thank you. And we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Come on. Let's praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So make sure you put on your wedding room.